Ultimate Director of the ESPN Sports Group. Uh, he was involved in the World Netball Championship and all that, so he's quite uh, good in marketing and, and uh, sports development, sports business development kind of experience. Uh, he has come to give us a talk on namely brand new you on marketing and profiling the athletes uh, and all that kind of things. Okay, can we please welcome Thank you. Um, actually, is it, if I don't use the mic, is that okay? Okay. I went. Okay, I think it's a small enough group. Just before I start, can I get a sense of who is who? Like, um, who is an who is an athlete? Put your the arm. Young one. <laughs> okay. Who is a coach? Any parents? Parents, uh, lovers, mistresses? No? Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. That, that just makes me, lets me uh, focus a little bit more on what we have because then that really means this presentation is about, about you guys. But let me, um, let me just go through here. And I, I like to put this picture up because I think it's pretty funny that you can spend your entire life to be a professional athlete. And then what gets posted on the internet is this with your butt showing. And just really, what it emphasizes to me is that it doesn't matter what you do in life, factors beyond your control will expose you in, you know, around the world. And you have to be prepared for that. And that's the life of an athlete when, um, when you are on a front and public, on a front and center stage. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, I'll get into in a second, but I want to ask you first, somebody just take a guess and tell me why do you think amateur athletes in any sport fail to raise money for themselves in sponsorship or value in kind, free airfares, free clothing. Why do you think it, the most common reason an amateur athlete is unsuccessful in raising money? Take, take a guess. Not attractive enough? That's a good point. What about you? What do you think? How, why, do you have a Nike sponsorship for a million dollars? How come? <laughs> what, what's that? <laughs> there we go. That's the number one reason, right there. Amateur athletes, every athlete does not believe they are good enough for somebody to give them money. If you are an athlete and you yourself don't believe somebody should support you, somebody should pay you, you don't have that mind frame, then who the hell is going to give you money? Who, who, wants, who, wants to, who wants to support a loser? Nobody wants to support a loser. But, you don't have to be a winner to get support. That's not the ultimate criteria, it's not beauty. But, it starts with you. You have to say, you know what? I put my heart and soul every day into my training. I go out there, I run, rain, shine, I jump, I do weights, I do it all myself. You know, the thing about athletics is, it's not a, uh, a team sport. You're not coming out there for a social aspect, you're not going out for beers with your rugby team after. You're out there, you're stretching, you're doing all this stuff yourself, and you're, you're motivating yourself. This is one of the very, very unique aspects of athletics. So you have to believe that everything that you're doing is good enough for somebody else to support you. And I tell you, it is. It is. Those criteria that you have that will make you a successful athlete is what makes successful businesses. They want to see somebody who's dedicated, who believes in themselves, who can achieve things you know, beyond their dreams, all of those things are stuff that marketers and companies want. So that's the number one reason it fails. You've got to believe in yourself. And that's what my conversation is today. I'm talking about athlete management and how to build yourself as a brand. And the most important thing, um, well, just let me just tell you the four things that I want to cover today. The first thing is your personal brand building. Uh, what can you do to develop yourself? The second thing is what are sponsors looking from you? What are they asking for? And whether you're a company or whether you're an athlete or whether you're a coach. Um, social media campaigns to drive your own brand value, things that you can do immediately. And then finally, some local initiatives to develop your career. The first thing I need to get across is that I'm not talking here about anti-doping. I'm not here talking about um, athlete performance. I'm not here talking about nutrition. I'm here to talk about building a company. Because every single person here is a company. And you have to look at yourself as a company. You're an athlete, yes, 
But what you're doing is creating a brand, a brand around yourself. You know, who are you? Who is your name? When you say my name is so and so, when you introduce your somebody to so and so, that's your brand. So you have to decide: is my brand crap, or is my brand Lamborghini? You know, we we're talking: are my Gucci? I mean, my sorry, my Giordano or my Gucci? This is all about the brand that you that you're trying to develop. Um, so I'm going to wrap this whole conversation with uh, six steps for each one of you to do immediately about developing your brand. Uh, I want to start first by just a few slides on myself. Um, I originally wanted to be a sumo wrestler, but uh, my mom said I was not fat enough at that time. I am now. Um, I have about 15 years of experience in the sports and media industry. I've had the opportunity to work on everything from the Olympics, Commonwealth Games, several world championships in athletics. I, my university scholarship was in athletics. I was a sprinter at that time. I don't, know, I don't look it now, but I was a sprinter at that time. And I quickly realized that actually you have to be fast to be good. <laughs> so I chose a different career and then went into the, uh, the sport management side of it. Um, but I've spent uh, the last six years with ESPN Star Sports, the number one broadcaster in Asia developing their businesses of sport and working with athletes and different companies um, throughout Asia. And before that I was with the PGA Tour as the Director of Communications where I ran all the press conferences and managed the most expensive, highly paid babies, crybabies in the world like Tiger Woods and VJ Singh and those kind of guys. Mm. Right now, I just launched my own company called One Fighting Championship. It's in the world's fastest sport of of mixed martial arts. It's um, a company that's backed by a group of foreign investors and we're running uh, eight events all across Asia. So personal brand building. This is about a rocket ship that's taken off and that's the metaphor I want you to think about as you are thinking who who am I? What's What, what am I trying to do with my brand? Because I'll tell you I'll tell you something is that nobody really and yourself wants to talk to somebody who is like this, flat. They want to talk to somebody that they see going like this, a rocket ship that has a vision to where they're going. Imagine if you're in a dance and you go to a school dance and there's lots of girls and you're a guy or a vice versa, whatever it is. You want to be the sexiest girl in that room. That's what you want to think of yourself as your brand. The kind of person that walks in there and everybody's like, how do I get a dance with that girl? You know, everyone's thinking, what do I have to do to get with this person? Now that girl who walked in as the sexiest, she didn't walk in there by accident. She didn't walk in there by accident and put on her clothes in the morning by accident and walked in there and was hot. I guarantee that woman, when she woke up, she looked in front of the mirror and said, how am I going to build this brand? How do I make myself really, really good? You know, and whether it's my clothes, my makeup, my hair, all those kind of things. And that all took preparation. So, it's a rocket ship that we're building here. The big thing that I have to always talk to about athletes is nobody cares about you. Nobody cares, actually. Like, I know this is really a harsh truth. You think you have your coaches, your family, your friends, all that kind of stuff. At the end of the day, the only person who can truly make a difference is yourself. You are the person that's at the starting line, that's at the throwing line, all that kind of stuff, and you've got to make it happen. So when it starts with you, and you care about yourself, about this brand that you're going to build, then people will want to jump on board. Um, so, but here's the challenge, is that, you know, unlike a, a football team, you're the president, you're the head of sales, you're the director of marketing, you're the PR manager, and you're all these roles and the janitor of a company called you, of, of, of yourself. So one of the first things that you have to look at is identify um, what is this brand called you? Why are you unique? And it's a, it sounds like a very obvious question, but not a lot of people sit down and think, why, why do people like to talk to me? Like, what is unique about me? And there is something unique about everybody. And you have to go through the cognitive process to think, okay, I have a great story, um, I was injured for a long time, or I was very poor and I threw all my money and my life into training, or uh, um, I have a 
whatever, this, this, and this, but you've got to think about what are those elements of you that's unique. Because when you identify that, that's what you're going to stick out of. That's how you be the prettiest girl in the dance. And those are the touch points that you will talk about when you talk to somebody and you're building your brand and you're selling yourself. You will integrate it slowly into the conversation of, oh, you know, you meet, uh, you meet somebody in banking and uh, you happen to be really good at math. Maybe you have an outstanding ability in math, you know, and you say to the bank, oh yeah, you know, I've always loved numbers. I, I graduated top of my school in, in math or finance or whatever. That's a unique selling point and that you let you connect with that person. But you're not going to be able to do that if you haven't thought about it in advance. The other thing is, how do people see you outside of the track? Who are you outside of training? Because this is um, uh, an element that athletes really don't understand, is that you make, it's easy to make the mistake that um, because you've done that extra lap, because you lifted that extra weight, because you did that extra set, that that actually matters to your brand and to a sponsor. In fact, it doesn't. I mean, no uh, Singtel, you go and talk to them about Singtel, you say, actually, today I did uh, four by 400s, you know, and I was only really supposed to do one, but I did three extra, and I, was, I vomited, and it was really, really tough. They don't care. That's not your unique selling point. It's not about how hard you train. They already expect you to train hard. So you have to find what are those other things outside of the track. I'm going to talk about learning to sell because learning to sell is, is no different from anything. Whether you're selling a car, a company, a business, yourself, all that kind of stuff. And every sale Every successful sale, without exception, has these four things. If you cannot do these four things, you will not sell whatever it is you're selling. Guaranteed. So I'm going to walk you through these. Um, credibility. The first thing is you have to have credibility. If I walked up to you on the street and I just said, Hey, 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 man, uh, let me teach you about uh, building a brand for yourself and athlete management. You know, let's go, go stand over here. You'd be like, What? Who are you? You know? But if I meet you, and we're in this context and say, hey, I have 15 years of sports media experience. I love athletics. I've, had, I've managed athletes. I've been with world-class athletes. Let me help you. Let me help you build your brand. Let me talk. Credibility. Now, once you establish credibility, anything you're going to sell or talk about after that, you're listening. If you don't have credibility, it doesn't matter what you sell. You could be selling the best product in the world, but if the person doesn't believe you're credible, you're out. Right? And think about when people approach you. Credibility is the first thing. The second thing is value proposition. You have to understand that unique selling point I was talking about. What are you offering to this, to this other person? Why, what, why is it important to you? How do I, okay, you know, let me help you make more money. I'm going to make you more successful, more famous. I'm going to help ease your stress because I'll be able to raise sponsorship dollars for you and ease your travel, all those kind of things. Value proposition, you put yourself in their shoes. The third thing is, and these last two things are very tricky, and that's why sales fall apart. Scarcity is nobody wants to be sold something that everybody can get. You know, if you're told, oh, buy this water, but the water is available everywhere, who cares? You don't have, you don't decide you want to buy it. But I tell you, hey guys, for the rest of this week, there are only two more bottles left in all of Singapore of water. So that's it. You got a train, you want to, we got two bottles left right here. Okay, let's start bidding. That's scarcity. You're like, okay, all right, I want, I want it, right? I, I need the bottle. The third thing, I'm mean, sorry, the fourth thing is urgency. Nobody, nobody works on your timeline. Everybody has their own timeline, right? You might want something tomorrow, you might want something next week. So to get people to work on your timeline, you have to deliver a sense of urgency to them. And you have to tell them, you know, we need to do this now. You need to sponsor me now as an athlete because actually I am going to be a gold medalist. I am the next Olympian. And I'm coming to you now, yes, I, I'm, I'm not yet. But if you don't sponsor me, somebody else will. And tomorrow I'm going to go talk to Starhub. So this is your chance now. I know, I know it sounds arrogant. I know it sounds like, who am I to be the, uh, uh, say that I'm going to be a gold medalist? But you know what? That's why I train every day. I'm not training for second. I'm not training for last. I'm training because one day I'm up there 
and put in this medal around me and I'm a gold medalist. That's what I dream of. Every day I wake up in the morning and every day that I throw up when, I, when I've done an extra set, that's what I'm dreaming of. That's my motivation. That's my goal. You're not lying by saying that that's your goal to be an Olympian and a gold medalist and you tell that to people and you sell them on it. There's no point saying to a company, actually, my, my plan, uh, you know, Tiger Airways, can you sponsor me for my next uh, competition? I'm really, I'm planning to be the third ranked long jumper in Singapore. You know, can I, please, can you sponsor me? <laughs> no, right? Your goal is to be number one in the world. So why not say that? Why not be, don't be shy about it. And urgency, so that's the key. Any, any questions so far? Does anybody want to stop me or? <laughs> All right. Take home point number number one. I said I was going to leave you with uh, six points. First one is make business cards now. It will be the most significant fifty dollar investment you have done in your life. I tell you, it is very very easy. Get somebody to to, to help you with it. There is no reason, no reason in the world. You put so much time into yourself, into your training, into what you're doing, that you shouldn't have a card that says, this is my name, my goal is to be a gold medalist, this is my sport, here's my email, here's my Facebook, contact me. Doesn't matter who you're giving it to, because you never know. You don't know if this person that you, you meet, or the friend of your dad's, or the friend of your mom's, is a multi-millionaire, and for them to give you $20,000 because they were so impressed that you had a business card, you don't know that, you know. Uh, I just want to tell you a story about an athlete, um, uh, Simon Whitfield. Does anybody know the athlete Simon Whitfield? He is a Canadian um, triathlon, Olympic, Olympic triathlete. And um, he uh, went to go train. He was in the rank. When he decided that he wanted to train for uh, Olympic, Olympic distance triathlon, he um, got his coach and his coach believed in him and all this kind of stuff and they had to move to another part of the country in Canada to, to go train. And um, the first thing he did was make business cards. And why was he had no money, as, a, as most athletes are, and he had to homestay with different people. But as a triathlete, he consumed so many calories, he couldn't stay with one family for too long. Like he would stay with a family for three weeks or two weeks before it just became you know too expensive and too much of a burden on the family. So you're really going from house to house to house to house. And everywhere he went, no matter where he was, in the shopping mall or whatever, when he talks to people, he said, here's my card. This is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm going to the Olympics. You know, I'm always looking for support. One of the little things is, I need a homestay. I'm staying with somebody so-and-so. They're a great family. And he just tells that story. Because it's a deep story to, to, to tell somebody, I'm training really hard and I just need your help. I need to stay at your house for a week. And people, but you have to keep telling that. You have to keep doing that story. When he won Athlete of the Year in Canada after he won his um, gold, uh, World Championship. He said, I have a, I'm supposed to give a speech about how great the sport is and how great athleticism is and all this kind of stuff. But I have five minutes to talk. So what I'm going to do is read from a list all the people that I stayed with. And so he, that's all he did for five minutes. At the end, everybody was like, ah! <laughs> he was crying. He was like, they were like, oh, this is so touching. He stood up there. He read the names of the sons, the daughters, the babies that were in each, because at each place he stayed, he took notes. He said, yeah, Mr. and Mrs. so-and-so, four-year-old daughter, three-year-old daughter, thank you. He read all his names. Boom, 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 boom. Five minutes straight, you know? The media, everybody loved him because that's how he appreciated them. So, first point, make business cards now. Second thing is, what are sponsors looking for? Well, they're looking for you to make the impossible possible. You know, this this picture is very different when it's a normal, you know, uh, uh, ski jumper, right? But it says it: make the impossible possible. So, don't be scared to dream when you're selling and when you're talking to these guys about what you're trying to achieve, because they want to hear it. Everybody wants to hear that impossible. So, before I talk about the, the sponsors, I need to give you a sense of why I really believe there's an opportunity in the sports industry right now. 
because we are at a crux point that in Asia sports has never been. You know, uh, it is a huge opportunity right now, and it's an opportunity for every single one of us to take on board. But you have to understand from a macro level what that opportunity is. So if you look at the global sports market in 2004, it was 125.9 billion. Today, globally, it's about, or 2009, it's 106, 168.9 billion. In Asia, in 2004, we went from 19.3 billion to 25.8. That's a multiplier jump. It's, it, it, imagine if you had a business and for every dollar, you, earn, you start earning two dollars right away. It's, 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 it's incredible. So there is money there. The industry is growing. It's very, very fast. This is a rocket ship. So there are opportunities, and it's why we've had AYG, YOG, why all these things are here. Why, it's not by accident that those sports are here. It's because there's corporate dollars and there's an opportunity behind it. And I call this the Lego effect. The reason why I call it the Lego effect is that in Asia, while all these new sports of money is coming in, it's not a mishmash of, of random le Lego pieces. You know, we actually have built a Lego structure that we see in North America, which has a strong history of sports. That you know, a uh, hundred years, two hundred years of development of professional sports in Europe and in North America. And now we're taking that model and we're transplanting it to Asia, and we're getting ready for it to explode, to come out. The Lego pieces are are, are built. Um, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I was looking at the sports industry, you couldn't go to school to study sports. You couldn't, you, can't, you couldn't tell your Asian parents, actually, I would like a career in sports. They'd be like, no, you want a career in dentistry. <laughs> you are going to go study to be a doctor. Uh, no, 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 I want to be a sprinter. No, no, that's, I don't want to be, that's not possible. But this Lego effect is transplanted here where I have an opportunity to explode. And because we have an opportunity to leapfrog and explode, it's why in Asia we're able, we're able to develop things like this already and have the Olympics in Beijing, the bird's nest. It's why we're able to go to the cube and build, just do these amazing things in a very short span in Asia that has taken the rest of the world 50, 100, 150 years to get to. So we're leapfrogging. And a leapfrog means an opportunity for you. So, back to the very first question when I said, you know, why do, um, why do amateur athletes fail to raise money? Sponsors are not necessarily looking for a star. They're not. They're looking for somebody that has the values that are equal to their company. And you have to be able to show that. And now look at this. You guys know this, this lady, right? Kornikova. Forbes, top 100 celebrities, money rank, 73 earnings at that time in 2009, 10 million titles, zero. This girl hasn't won crap, you know, but she's out there and she's one of the highest earners and highest paid athletes. Why? Yeah, okay, she's gorgeous. I give her that. And there's a magical mix of, of gorgeousness and, and all those kind of things. But she knows how to create a brand and she knows how to sell herself. You see this logo up here, K-Swiss? K-Swiss K -Swiss never, ever, ever sponsored tennis. Ever, ever. It happened to be a brand that she liked. She called up the K-Swiss guy and said, you know what? Your brand is down here, you're not really anything. You can sponsor me for a steal, $2 million. And I'll wear your hat every press conference I got. That guy said, wow, you know, <laughs> this is not Nike, this is not, you know, it, it, she's not going after that, she's going after a completely different angle around her brand. So, where do you start with sponsorship? First of all, this is a silly question, but how many of you have parents? Right? Everyone has parents. How many of uncles, aunts, friends? Now, that is your first circle to start with. And I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what you should do. What you should do is, you see, it's all about building these um, building blocks of success. If let's say your father works for Starhub, and you say, and you say to you say to Starhub, and you get your dad to say, you know what, I have this competition coming up in Jakarta next year called the uh, Asian Games, and 
My, I'd like my dad to come with you. You know? So, can StarHub, can you sponsor my dad a week leave to support me? And StarHub probably will say yes, if you ask it the right way. If you go through all those four selling points that I went through earlier, and you end with, I would like my dad to have a week leave from StarHub. And in exchange, I'll put your StarHub logo on my website, on my Facebook.